All glory to the originators of truth and understanding. Praise to the innovators of steel and synth. Praise to the shapers of flesh, of bone, and of mind. Glory to those who re-sculpted the sustaining earth and the life-giving sun. Praise to the senders of signals, who even now whisper into machine ears and give life to the inanimate. Praise to those who traveled the stars and the realms beyond the stars. All glory to the originators of truth and understanding. The Catechism of Lore. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk about Clark's Law. The unwritten rule that dictates any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. In the same vein, Thor said in his first film that he came from a world where science and magic are one and the same. Monty Cook looked at both of these conceits and said, Hold my drink. In the past, I've made fun of the Tolkien melting pot, my nickname for the mishmash of Tolkien, Howard, and Moorcock that is at the heart of Dungeons and Dragons' attempt at a pseudo-setting. I pick on this because there are certain assumptions about what fantasy has to be, much to my annoyance because of this. Especially since it's a very British Isles take on fantasy that is at the heart of these assumptions, which is ironic given two of the authors. But what there is something wrong with is the idea of that being what you have to do. I bring this up because I distinctly recall Monty Cook's previous work, Planescape, being derided as too weird to be fantasy. I remember the same thing happening with a expansion to Morrowind, whose name currently escapes me at the time of this recording. I find this laughable, as it's a claim that exposes a narrow view of fantasy. Because, you know, it's not like pulp is a thing. This brings us to Numenera, a weird future built on the back of eight previous worlds of untold technology. Kind of. See, this week we're delving into the follow-up of the 2013 spiritual successor to Planescape, Numenera Discovery. Discovery is not exactly a second edition, more like a catch-up to bring it up to the now universal cipher system. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Monty Cook games have always had a strong sense of visual identity, and Discovery is no exception. More impressive is that the reused art is at a minimum, and a lot of it is really good to boot. At about 418 pages, Discovery is a fairly dense book, and it kind of needs to be, given how it wears weird on its sleeve, and thus there's a lot more that it's going to need to explain. Much like its predecessor, the game loves its side columns, all in the nature of establishing its particular vision. While I do have an issue with some parts feeling a bit scrunched, it's ultimately everything you could ask for in a core book. Also, an index. Now the number three is one you'll be intimately familiar with throughout character creation. And we'll explore this with our sample character, a bodyguard named Kolok. Characters are summarized in a single sentence known as, My character is an adjective, noun, who verbs. These, th these adjectives, noun, and verb is the descriptor, type, and focus. For this, we'll be going with intelligent, glaive, and bears a halo of fire. So in other words, Kolak is an intelligent glaive who bears a halo of fire, obviously. We'll start with the glaive part. As a tier 1 glaive, as Numenera does not have a leveling system, we have a starting pool of 11 in might, 10 in speed, and 7 in intellect, with 6 points to distribute among the 3. We'll put 3 of these in intellect, 2 in speed, and 1 in might. In addition to this, we have an edge of 1 in might and speed and an effort of 1. As a glaive, we can choose to gain a plus 1 bonus to damage to melee or ranged weapons. We'll go with melee in our case. We're also practiced in armor, meaning we reduce the speed cost by 1. Glaives have a set of unique feats associated with them known as fighting moves. We'll start with two of these, Fleet of Foot and Aggression. The former allows us to move as part of another action, while the latter allows us to take a more offense over defense take on melee combat. For our starting equipment, we'll go with clothing, a verd, a kind of forked sword, a shield, medium armor, an explorer's pack, two ciphers, a density nodule and a rejuvenator, and one oddity, a blob of clay that takes shapes when left alone, along with five shins, Numenera's version of currency. The next part is descriptor, which we went with intelligent in. This descriptor gives us a plus two to intellect, and makes us skilled in an area of knowledge, in this case, terrain, and remembering things experienced directly. 
In these, we are considered trained. Finally, the focus, which automatically grants an ability every tier. In our case, we gain Shroud of Flame. This allows us to surround our body in flames at the cost of an intelligence point. Character creation might be a bit jumpy, especially in how I described it, but I like how it ties to its three pillars. That said, this is not a game for people who like to have a wide host of abilities, especially if you play as a jack. I'm still on the fence about ciphers being single use, but that's something I'll get into later. Numenera uses the cipher system, much like the previously reviewed Gods of the Fall. While the cipher system technically started with Numenera, Discovery is an attempt to catch up Numenera to the changes made in the six years since with the Universal Cipher System. Regardless, the Cipher System uses a d20 roll that's compared to a leveled difficulty system, ranging from 1 to 10, with the target number being equivalent to the level times 3, so a level 5 difficulty action would need a 15 to pass. Instead of modifying the d20 roll itself, more often than not you'll be modifying the difficulty level of the roll. The first way this is done is through the three stat pools of Might, Speed, and Intellect. This acts as Health and Extra Effort, and the latter it's applied as, well, Effort. By spending three points, plus two more for each level after the first, from a pool tied to the action, namely Might, Speed, or Intellect, you may decrease the difficulty level by one for that action. This can be reduced by Edge, which lowers expenditure on all point spends by that amount. So if you have an Edge of one in Might, you only have to spend two points of might for one level of effort. Effort is also soft capped by the character's effort rating, which is equal to their tier. So a tier one character can only spend one level's worth of effort. Effort can be used to increase damage as well, increasing it by three for each level. Skills act as a kind of free effort for this approach, where being trained in a skill reduces difficulty by one level, and being specialized in a skill reduces it by two. But as we stated earlier, Discovery is an attempt to catch up Numenera to the Cypher system it spawned. The first change this brings is how armor works. Instead of spending might and speed pools to wear armor, Discovery modifies the cost to apply effort to speed for 1 for light armor, 2 for medium, and 3 for heavy. In addition, the use of Cyphers, Numenera's systems for strange one-use items, is simplified. Originally, Cyphers were split between Anoetic and Occultic Cyphers, which took up 1-2 to two slots respectively. Instead, everything just takes one slot. The third major change comes into play with the tier system for character foci. Instead of having all abilities set, at tiers 3 and 6, the focus splits in two. The last piece of Discovery's changes is the concept of player intrusion. Each type has its own suite of potential intrusions, so a glaive will have different intrusions than a jack. I will admit to enjoying the cipher system, but it's not perfect. The concept of resource and health being one and the same is neat on paper, but in practice it often leads to people playing defensive as much as they can. The use of intrusions and spending XP is within the same umbrella issue, and it kind of reminds me a little bit too much of the whole spending experience to create magic items all the way back in D&D 3rd edition. Given how Numenera is themed around exploration and discovery, I'm not sure if that plays to its strengths. Additionally, there's still the issue of being more reliant on effort at higher level encounters, in order to even have a chance to develop one's abilities. Leveling should feel like you're getting better, even with the less straightforward use of tiers in Numenera. Once again, it's no surprise that the video game version, Tides of Numenera, uses a traditional hit point system. Perhaps the tabletop version should follow suit? Weighing in on Discovery leaves me... conflicted. It really isn't a second edition, like I said before, it's more of a revise. While it does make some solid changes, I'm not sure if it's enough to make up for its shortcomings, some of which have been addressed in the optional rules of the Cypher System core book. Beyond that, the setting of the Ninth World is still incredibly fascinating, and it's a nice player-driven experience. However, the issue I have is flexibility. The Cypher System needs to adopt aggressive tactics and make players want to use effort and pools, and this isn't the level of low fantasy to justify being a miser. Even with those misgivings, I would give Numenera Discovery a stamp of strongly recommended. Despite the issues I have with the system, Cypher is flexible enough to address these without requiring too much overhauling. This isn't Palladium, after all. However, that rating is with the assumption that you're just getting into Numenera. If you have the original, this is technically a nice add, but I'd hesitate to call it a requirement. Either way, Numenera is most certainly a unique experience, and the medium is all the better for its presence. Anything that makes the Tolkien melting pot get nuked can't be all that bad.